are live. Hello, uh, hi everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to the panel, Building a Multiracial Socialist Movement. Um, my name is Justin Charles. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a member of the Democratic Socialists of America National Political Committee. Uh, I'm also a member of the Convention uh, Steering Committee. Uh, we're here uh, this evening slash afternoon to talk about uh, how we build the kind of multiracial movement we need for socialism in this country. Um, and I have uh, three amazing panelists. Um, so before I get to our panelists, I just kind of want to give a little bit of context. Um, the working class is divided um, along many lines, uh, one, of them, one of them being race. Uh, as socialists, our job is to tie together some seemingly disparate uh, demands uh, under the umbrella of building a mass movement for socialism. Um, and in DSA, we're, we're embarking on, on that in a lot of different ways. Um, we have some folks here that are going to talk about the ways in which we're doing that. Um, so to start, I want to introduce Farah Forrest. Uh, bear with me. Uh, I have your, well, I know Farah. Farah is the assembly member uh, from New York City. Sorry, I lost my notes. Give me a moment. Sorry. Eh, there we go. Okay. Uh, Ferris and Front Forest is the New York State Assembly member for the 57th District. Uh, she's a tenant organizer, a member of DSA, uh, a maternal health nurse, and a new mother. Um, so, Farah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Justin. Um, hi, everyone. As Justin said, my name is Ferris and Front Forest. I represent areas in Brooklyn that include Prospect Heights, Clinton Hill. Fort Green Park, uh, a little bit of bed and the best part of Crown Heights, where I live. <laughs> um, I really wanted to use this time to talk about um, what it really means to organize and put that, have an organizing um, strategy in office, right? And so it really starts off with my story and how I got into organizing um, in my most recent years up until being elected into office. Um, back in 2016, I uh, had a, there was a condo conversion that was happening at my building. My building is rent stabilized. And so what that meant is that every time a unit went empty, that building, that, that unit now no longer belonged in like affordable housing stock. It is now luxury. Um, it's, it's subject to market rate price, i.e. Um, luxury condominium. And so even though we weren't being kicked out right away, but I knew that through harassment, evictions, basically, you know, basic uh, building neglect, my landlord was going to make sure that he was going to get us out and make profit off of us and off of the building. And so I organized the first tenant association meeting in my building. And I, along with um, Michael Hollingsworth and um, a couple of other really, really cool tenants, um, really pushed uh, a strong uh, consensus in our building. And that consensus is like, no way, we're not going. And you're make you're going to make sure that you're going to take care of the rent stabilized tenants in this building. And so this was very, very um, instrumental in not only building my identity as a tenant organizer, because this tenant organizer identity was basically what propelled me into office. Um, but also it, 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 it built a movement in my building that transformed a lot of what was going on in Crown Heights at the time. So for me personally, the starting my TA um, connected me to the, how, the 
housing organization in the neighborhood, the Crown Heights Tenants Union. And that's where I use my skills, both as like a tenant organizer, but then also um, as a facilitator. I've been doing facilitations for years in a professional capacity, but then I was able to apply it to housing. And then that I was able to teach others how to ten start a tenant association and then eventually know your rights and know your rights as a tenant. And then eventually joining the Housing Justice for All Coalition, where I then like got arrested in Albany um, for housing. And then eventually I was like, oh, wait, if we are doing this and we have elected officials that don't even bother listening, don't even want to open up the door, maybe we should replace them. So it was like a domino effect that um, ultimately let, lead, led uh, leading to the district then voting in someone who is very strong on housing rights, on tenants rights. Um, and so it was very important for me in the early stages to make sure that that same organizing strategies that we used um, to push the housing agenda, to put the tenant agenda um, forward on the outside, we make sure it's in what I do as a elected official. So when we use whip sheets, um, when we use uh, strategies like protest and rallying and um, doing one-on-ones, right? Um, door knocking. These are the very same strategies that were successful um, for us as tenants. Now is very successful for me as a legislator because I then push for housing in, um, especially when we talk about cancel the rent and the eviction moratorium, um, if we were able to get ERAP today, it's because we were using the same strategies. Um, in addition, um, it helped me outside of housing. So using these same strategies, being able to say, I literally had one-on-ones with my legislators, having a coalition um, behind me to help me with less is more, a bill that, talk, that tackled technical violations where people were going to jail or run being late to a meeting or something like that. Like that's ridiculous. You want to eradicate things that bar people from freedom and, and making sure that they are able to be in the community. These same strategies were what we were using um, to make sure that less is more passed both the House and both the Senate and the Assembly. And now we're going to use that same strategies um, to then make sure it passes the governor's table. So um, being very much issue-based, right? Um, it really focuses what I do as a legislator, helps me to uh, recruit and, and enlist the help of volunteers. Here we have X issue and we need to use X, Y, and Z strategies to make sure we're, we're pushing this issue. Um, but then also, it's what brings ultimately people to socialism. Because when people see that there is a democratic process, there is a systematic process to how we can change our lives, that really is a wonderful call to others to see not only the benefits of organizing together, but then when we're organizing like this, this is how we make socialism work. Um, and so, Yes, that's what I wanted to give my piece. I wanted to leave more time for others to ask questions at the end and for others to speak, but that's my take on how to make sure we do it and do it well in office. Thanks, Justin. Thank you, Farah. Uh, thanks so much. Um, I, I'll ask you some questions about that a little bit later after we get to everybody else. Um, okay, so for our next panelist, um, I'd like to introduce um, my, my fellow National Political Co Committee member, uh, our intrepid secretary of the MPC, uh, I don't know what we would do without her, uh, Christian Hernandez. Uh, Christian Hernandez, as I said, is a member of the MPC from the North Texas chapter of DSA. Um, we didn't give it, we, I didn't get a bio, but I will just say that Christian is one of my favorite people. Um, and She's wonderful. She's going to talk about abolition as it relates to our struggle for a multiracial socialist movement. Awesome. Thank you so much, Justin. Um, appreciate the introduction. I mean, that bio, I think, is, is good enough. Um, and also, uh, apologies, There's it is thunderstorming in Texas. So 
there might be uh, some some shaky internet or my dogs might uh, react to the weather. So apologies in advance. But um, hello, comrades. Um, super excited to get to talk a little bit about um, some of the work I've been able to do locally. Um, and I think in particular, uh, shedding some light on what this could possibly mean for DSA going forward, uh, particularly uh, in light of us uh, being able to have a uh, robust abolition working group that has kicked off this year. And I'm super excited about both the direction um, and the energy behind that. Uh, we have some really great comrades um, on the steering committee committed to that work. Um, and in particular in Texas, you know, um, it's important to always be mindful of, of the local conditions. And in uh, Dallas in particular, we have a very strong police union um, and have to contend with both the Republicans and the Democrats simultaneously. Um, and uh, not to mention, we have a long legacy of racism in our city. Dallas used to have the largest KKK in the in the country. Um, and, you know, those people didn't just die. They left roots. Um, and so we are dealing uh, with enemies who hide in plain sight with with badges uh, in suits and ties, um, overseeing the institutions that affect our everyday lives. Um, and so I think that's super important as well to constantly be aware of like who our opponents are, who our enemies are, um, and how that plays out in the work that we're doing. Um, and so as far as, you know, uh, abolition work being still relatively new to DSA, I think a lot of uh, comrades who are now doing this work as DSA um, have have a lot of the experiences coming from outside organizations. Um, although we do have some chapters who've been doing this work, which is amazing. Um, I did end up personally taking part in this work outside of DSA with a local organization made up of BIPOC women who lead with a focus on art and imagination. Um, and I think that's super important to uh, the concept and practice of abolition, uh, imagination and reminding people of what they deserve. Super important because we we really can sometimes get bogged down in thinking like this is this these are the choices that we have when really we're not given any choice as far as um, how we live our lives with dignity um, and how things are and so being able to expand the realm of the possible is super important in this work um, and we 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 carried that out in, in a myriad of ways again being a very small small outside organization it was uh, you know we had to build up some capacity so we recruited people to be what we called ambassadors. And they essentially then recruited, uh, you know, 20 or so people that they knew, their friends, their family, uh, and really encouraged people to reach out to folks who maybe weren't leftists, people who, you know, just people they knew, they had a relationship with. Because at the end of the day, that relationship is what's important to being able to navigate some of these conversations, answer some of the really tough questions of like, what do you mean we don't need jails? What do you mean we don't need police? Um, and it just makes it so much easier to be able to have those conversations when there's a base level of trust, uh, which is why it was super important for people to be talking to people that they already knew about concepts that, um, you know, maybe were less familiar with those folks. Um, and so we created guides and in a program to essentially train people to be able to have those conversations and had a bunch of really great successful conversations, uh, you know, with with that work. And uh, we supplemented that through a community survey. Um, but of course, when you're looking at a survey and who's answering, we did ask questions about demographics, where people lived, um, and looking at particular city council districts where we knew there was, um, you know, uh, a majority black or brown population living there. Um, and we did initially find that a lot of the people who were filling out the survey were heavily white or Latino. And so we were obviously largely missing the, uh, the demographic that was the most affected by policing um, in our city, which was the black, which was black people. And so uh, being able to then intentionally refocus, like, okay, we're not being able to meet our goals. So what do we do? Um, and so being able to partner with um, organizations, um, particularly black churches, we're really looking at getting people involved in this fight. Um, and so we actually were able to go out and do this mega survey. And again, this is in the midst of COVID. So um, being able to do that and um, having people, I think we ended up with like 700 surveys um, filled out and having conversations with people about the police and the initial resistance of like, oh, well, we need police, but do they actually keep us safe? Um, and so being able to make sure that our survey then was also reflective of the demographics of our city, super important. 
Um, and then that kind of led into the actual fight, which was the budget fight and being able to have people participate in that process. And I think one of the most important things that we were able to do, and I think something that's like a really big avenue for DSA members and DSA chapters is demystify, demystifying that process for people. Um, you know, it's one thing to say, here's when the city council meeting is, you have to show up. Um, but it's another to say, here's how you sign up to speak. Here's where the agenda is. Here are the items that are working against our own class interests. Here's how you make a strong point in favor of what you're saying with your particular voice. So we're not changing people's voices. We're not giving people talking points necessarily, but we are helping people really hone in why this matters to them and why, you know, their council member should care about um, the points that they're making. Um, and we did manage to get $7 million taken away from the overtime budget. But again, it was important for us to focus uh, and pay attention to how our demands are being chipped away at, because ultimately it was very easy for city council to then just, you know, approve overtime money um, later on and essentially, um, you know, making our, our, our efforts somewhat redundant in terms of the goals that were reached. But uh, I do think that there were a lot of seeds planted with members of the community who were then seeing um, how easy it was for them to get plugged in and get involved um, directly in a way um, that, you know, was visible and uh, deeply felt for folks. And so I think ultimately, you know, we, we, we definitely need a powerful multiracial coalition to connect our struggles. And I think this can feel like an uphill battle, particularly with the very demographics that are prevalent in our organization. Um, you know, we our membership results, uh, we did a membership survey not too long ago and the preliminary results do showcase that we are an org that is predominantly white and predominantly male. Um, but as such, our org has to fight hard not to reflect the interests and cultural assumptions of those segments of the working class that are overly represented in our organization right now, because none of us are, uh, you know, complacent with making sure that that's how it is now. We want we want to grow and we want to make sure that, um, you know, the organization reflects the entire working class. Um, but, it, you know, our, our survey results also show that many of the most dedicated and active members of our organization are women, people of color. Um, so I think there's a matter to continuing to cultivate leadership of these demographics in our organization of these members. Um, and it's super important now more than ever because we need these multiracial coalitions in order to effectively counter right-wing racism and anti-immigrant rhetoric uh, and politics. And so um, it, I think it behooves us to, as political leaders to think about how we can address structural barriers to participate in uh, political organizing, whether that's time, energy, or resources, um, even geographic location, the way that segregation plays a huge role in who is in our neighborhoods, who we're interacting with on a daily basis. Um, but I think ultimately, uh, and I'll just wrap up and say, I think building a multiracial socialist movement requires intention and race cannot be an afterthought in that. Uh, we do need to be consistently assessing whether we're making progress on our goals for our organization to be more representative of the entire working class and make sure that we're constantly asking ourselves, are we building power in and with communities of color? Thank you so much, Christian. Uh, our next panelist uh, is Ashley Payne. Uh, Ashley Payne's a member of East Bay DSA uh, and rank and file member of SEIU 1021, uh, a member, a delegate of the Contra Costa Labor Council uh, and co-chair of the Democratic Socialist Labor Commission Steering Committee, uh, and also an outgoing member of the Growth and Development Committee uh, Steering Committee on which I serve with, with Ashley. Um, She's also an active member of the Bread and Roses and Afro-Socialist Caucuses. All right, Justin, thank you so much. Um, hello, comrades. I'm excited to be on here with you all talking about the labor movement and multiracial organizing. And I'm honored to be on here, of course, with Farah and Christian. Um, I'm very excited. So I'm here to talk about why the labor movement is a very critical piece of building a multiracial movement for social in the United States. So just some brief history, bear with me. Um, the labor movement in the United States has historically actually demonstrated unity across groups, even when the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, was the dominant trade union federation and had segregated locals by race and nationality and language. They were always being challenged by other major labor organizations 
like the Knights of Labor in the 19th century, which attracted 60,000 to 90,000 newly freed Black folks just 10 years after the U.S. Civil War. And then in the early 20th century, when the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW, formed, they started from the outset organizing all groups, emphasizing Black workers especially, and not making that an afterthought. And then a couple of decades later, you had the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, doing a lot of the same work, really centering Black workers and organizing Black workers. And they eventually forced a merger between the AFL and the CIO in 1955. And I bring up this history because it's important to remember that mainstream labor had always been challenged by these large organizations that were more interested in building a multiracial movement. And by leaving that out, it creates more division. And that's the thing that what unites us is that we're all workers. We all have to work to survive. And we also have that relationship to capital and the ruling class. That's what binds us. And we can't let our differences separate us because we are more powerful in numbers and we have the numbers on our side. So we have to be a powerful, united working class. We have to celebrate and embrace our identities, work through differences and the particular challenges that certain sections of the working class face in order to create that genuine unity because the only way forward is through. So labor has had a long history of having to confront these challenges very directly. You know, data and statistic after statistic shows that unionized workers are better off of every group than their non-union counterparts, you know, especially around wages. And that union difference, that union advantage, couldn't be any more significant and pronounced for workers of color. So the workplace is where you're more likely to come across people who are outside of your personal network. And again, you know, Christians reference this a little bit. So as Farha, so as Farha, um, sorry, I have a friend named Farhad. <laughs> um, and there's study after study showing how segregated society still is in 2021 and how my, most white people are still only friends with white people. How there's study after study showing how housing is still very segregated because of the legacy of Jim Crow, redlining, settler colonialism's reservation system, and nativism and xenophobia ghettoizing many immigrant groups. The workplace cuts through these differences and puts you in contact with lots of different kinds of people. And that's what makes organizing at work and the labor movement unique and powerful compared to other base building models. So at work, workers learn how to engage in some form of class politics, just at a minimum because you're at work and you get paid to do a job. That relationship between workers and your boss and employer, that is a microcosm for class struggle. Of course, unionized workplaces have a workforce that is already primed and more receptive to class politics and potentially class struggle unionism. And that just means bargaining for the common good, bargaining for those broader issues that affect the entire working class. And that's why it's critical that unionized workers take control of our unions, democratize them, so that we can focus and invest energy and resources into expanding the labor movement to reach those who are not in unions, who are disproportionately people who look like me, Farah and Christian on this call, and Justin, of course. So there are numerous stories of solidarity in the labor movement, and that's the most essential piece to multiracial organizing is solidarity, fighting for others like you'd fight for yourself. Bernie said it during his campaign, are you ready to fight for someone you don't know? Black feminists have said it, we're not free until we're all free. The labor movement has said it, an injury to one is an injury to all. And building that solidarity in the, with people that you see 40 hours a week, there's no other terrain that gives workers that much exposure to one another, that much potential to struggle together. That's how revolutionary relationships are built, through collective struggle. So there's a so much history here. I'm not going to go into all of them. I'm going to give you some highlights. Um, there's a book of worker stories called rank and file. On page 111, there's a story um, by Sylvia Woods. Uh, she is, well, was a laundress in Chicago in the early 20th century. And it gives a really good picture of how a multiracial working, um, a multiracial work site had to come together, overcome their differences in a very extreme circumstances and improve their working conditions and how they won. Um, another example is a comrade of ours who's in DSA, who's a nurse in Oakland at Highland Hospital. He led his union to win back the job of one of their nurse coworkers who had been deported to Mexico. And it took them 16 months, but they stuck with it and they won. So unions are now organizing for voting rights as they organized during the civil rights movement in which labor was a critical element. Their labor movement organized in the wake of George Floyd's murder last summer and is still organizing now, removing police from schools and around shifting funds away from law enforcement and the criminal justice system in general and investing those in social programs and services around the country. Internationally, labor was instrumental in combating apartheid in South Africa, here and in South Africa. Palestinian labor unions have 
stage general strikes and have been organizing against their occupation seeking to build connections with labor movements abroad. And maybe the most important existential crisis facing us as people is climate change and global warming. It's gonna take all of us to keep the ruling class from profiteering our lives into extinction. And there are countless more examples. And these stories aren't to deny that there isn't racism in the labor movement, but those sections have become smaller and smaller over time because of organizing. Labor has lost its way, of course, you know, since the dawn of this new refined capitalism we call neoliberalism. But we have to remember we're uncharted territory. The U.S. has a number of factors that other countries just don't have in their histories, namely. They don't have settler colonialism and slavery and Jim Crow and xenophobia. No other country has to contend with all of those elements together. And so building a, a multiracial movement for social in the United States, the richest country the world has ever seen, is the most immediate task of the socialist movement today. And I'm personally honored to be part of the labor movement. I find enormous pride in its achievements and everything the movement has overcome to become the longest standing multiracial mass movement in the United States. And I hope DSA can continue bringing the socialist movement and labor movement together. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley, uh, and thank you uh, to all three of you. Um, so, you know, one thing I guess that I'm, I'm hearing that's common amongst the, the, the three of your, uh, your talks is um, talking about the need to build solidarity, to kind of create, um, create uh, situations in which people can build that kind of belief that they can actually change their circumstances, their material circumstances for the better. Um, and in that struggle, um, really getting a sense of their own power. Um, I'm wondering if, if, if any of you, you know, and feel free to jump in as you like, could share any kind of uh, your own kind of personal experiences with that kind of uh, realization of power uh, that comes from collective action. I think I can stay, take a stab at it because um, today, like I'm, I'm an assembly member now, but like this is not something that really was is natural to me, I guess, because it, it the idea of organizing is something that's, um, it's something that has to be learned. So it's interesting. I say that my springboard into um, this political sphere um, really came from tenant organizing, but I'm also a union nurse. I've also been organizing around issues like Dream Act or um, climate change since I was 16. But this was really the first time that I felt like I was able, I had um, power. Um, and I, and that, that came from my identity. The fact that as a black woman and, and having the platform that I had at Crown Heights Tenants Union, and eventually I kind of got hip that way, wait, wait. All the people that I'm meeting through the Housing Justice for All group, for all, um, Crown Heights Tenants Union, um, all the organizing spaces, I'm like, they all go into a meeting that I'm not a part of. What is this meeting that they're going to? And that's when I was like, oh, there's a DSA? What's that? <laughs> you know, and then that's how I jumped in. But it's because we were organizing outside, like we were organizing around so many issues, so many topics. Like I learned that automatically the fact that I was part of a union as a nurse, that made me a socialist. So even if I didn't um, ascribe to this idea of collectivism and we do it better in groups, the fact that I'm a union nurse makes me automatically a socialist. So that I didn't get that when I was learning, when I was a nurse. You know, and I was working on the floor at Kings County. I got that later on as a tenant activist. So I think it's important for us to expand the issues that we're um, we're tackling each and every day and continuing to touch people in a very personal way. So that way, at some point, they're going to obviously see themselves part of a, nat a multi -nat multi racial movement because it's 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 the evolution of what our it's the evolution of what we're doing here at some point capitalism is going to break down it is a machine that feeds on human and human lives and human experience so whether it be on a saturday morning when i got a door when somebody knocked on my door um 
or it could be you at the work at the workplace or you literally on the operating table um, with a C-section. At some point, socialism, at some point, the issue of the day is going to smack you in the face. And then you're going to see that there is an answer, a solution, which is organization. Christian or, or Ashley, you know, if you have any, any thoughts on, on the question about realizations of, of, of collective power, feel free to weigh in. Sure. Uh, yeah, I was like, I should do it now while my dogs are still being quiet. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think a, a big part of this is, is being able to build solidarity, but also to remind people that they're protagonists in the fight for their own lives. Um, so much of what people want to explain away, and I think the Democrats are famous uh, for doing this, is, is saying people don't do things because they are apathetic. And I don't think that's true. I don't know <laughs> very many people who don't care about their own lives, um, but they often feel powerless um, in the ability to get things done. And so how do we remind people um, in a significant, like, material way that they have agency. Um, and so one of the, one of my first experiences, I think with like collective power was actually with my, when I first started organizing, which was with a uh, community organization around immigrant rights. Um, and so we would host these DACA workshops, which would help, you know, three, 400 people at a time. And, you know, we were just like a ragtag team of like, you know, uh, maybe 20 people who uh, all volunteers, many people who did not have status as well. Um, and um, we're really just sort of trying to figure things out. And so uh, essentially, it, it came down to us helping people fill out DACA applications and saving them the money um, that it costs for attorneys um, and, you know, being able to walk them through the process because they were the ones actually filling out their application. Now, it might seem like that's such a like a very small thing, but so many of these people who came came back as volunteers because they were then felt empowered to be able to do this and like better understand this document that held so much power over their lives. And they wanted to come back and help other people. And, uh, you know, then we would also have um, parents come back and help like in in the kitchen they were they were you know making lunches for volunteers um, we had uh, people who really like talking on the phone making phone calls following up with folks um, and so a lot of it I think is also being able to um, have people plug into ways that are familiar uh, to them to themselves already like uh, I know a lot of in my community a lot of the señoras are you know, <laughs> hitting up the phone all the time. So why not use that to, to uh, you know, our ability to do that within the context of a campaign? And I think that, um, you know, once once we're able to do something like that together, you know, sort of things that feel really uh, like an uphill battle and all of a sudden it comes into fruition, um, getting involved in that process and that experience is part of how we fight against these internalized divisions, um, whether that's age, race, um, you know, gender, what have you, um, because I think being able to do that gives us the experience of working with um, each other and finding our interests in alignment with each other, um, but also the risk of losing bonds us um, because uh, it's not just about like the win. It's also the transformation in the act of collective struggle. Um, and I think that process is essential to building solidarity um, because we don't always live to see the wins that we are fighting for. Um, and so how we manage the campaigns that we do um, and how we how we fight our fights, essentially, it's not just the fight, but how we manage those fights um, matters if the aim of, of the campaign is transformation. All right. Should I take a shot at this now, Justin? All right. Please. Um, I'm going to date myself a little bit. So some of my first like political activity was in 2002 and 2003 protesting the Iraq war invasion. So before George Floyd um, was killed last summer and all the marches around the world, that had actually been previously been like the largest time we'd seen activism around the world was were those marches. Um, and we, as we all know, we're still in Iraq and it didn't prevent anything. So I really started thinking a lot about activism versus organizing and what that really looks like. You know, in college, I did campus organizing that didn't really, or campus activism that didn't really pan out in the way that I was hoping that we could make that really fundamental change. I worked for a couple of educational nonprofits thinking, you know, that would be the way to make change. And I was working in Oakland Public Schools in 2010, 2011, and the Oakland teachers were 
debating going on strike and wanted to go on strike, but I was in the mirror core and we couldn't support or be political. And that was weird. And I didn't like that because I was like, we should support the teachers. These kids need good schools. They need textbooks. They need pencils. Um, my nonprofit had to lend pencils to the school because they were out of pencils at the end of the school year during their testing. I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, and then I worked for another educational nonprofit in New York. Some of these places are going to go unnamed because I've signed <laughs> agreements. Um, and also I talked about unions there because the turnover was so bad. We were so poorly paid and we were doing really difficult work and the, te and the students just didn't want to keep talking about their trauma over and over again. I felt bad that I'm like, I know you've had three advisors in 12 months, but can you tell me what's going on again? And so I was really thinking through like nonprofits aren't the way to make change. You know, they exploit our good intentions, don't pay us anything. There's high burnout, high turnover. That's not good for the people that we're supposed to be serving. And we're not really bringing together people and like building a mass movement in the way that I thought we were going to do when we were out there protesting against the Iraq war. And that didn't pan out into anything. So I really learned that power like in 2016 when I went on strike in my job. I was shocked. I, I grew up in this county in Contra Costa County and it's kind of conservative. There's a lot of Republicans as you go more East. Um, and my workplace is very diverse. And the fact that we went on strike and we went out for 10 days, I am, I'm still shocked that we pulled that off. And the wins were a little mixed, but that was like the first time I had felt like any sense of winning in any of the politic political stuff that I had done before. And, you know, East Bay DSA was instrumental to the Oakland teacher strike in early 2019, right after UTLA went on their amazing strike. And being part of that was amazing. We did so much work for Bread for Ed to make sure that teachers could extend their fight to really win for students. And it's revitalized their union. You know, when we went on strike in 2016, it also revitalized our union too. We've been so active thinking about maybe potentially going on strike when our contracts end next year, potentially. And so I know that the power of collective action is real. It's there, but you have to connect it to people's material conditions. And you have to have a very like clear vision and you have to organize across so many differences. And so I really learned that in the labor movement better than I worked at nonprofits, better than I did doing sort of campus activism, doing die-ins on the, you know, the steps of our administrative hall and all of that. You know, this is actually where I see like things actually happening. And as I've learned more about the labor movement too, I've seen that like, what the labor movement has really delivered for people. We would not have weekends. We would not have OSHA, which has been huge during COVID. What would we do if we didn't have like safety regulations that labor has won over a hundred years ago right now during a pandemic? I mean, that's, I don't know. I don't even know <laughs> how bad things would be. They're already bad, but it would be a lot worse. And so, yeah, being in the labor movement has really changed like my mind about that and then shown the potential for collective action across so many different groups. Thanks, Ashley. Um, so I'm going to take a question uh, that was uh, from the uh, from an audience member. Um, this is from Chris uh, from the uh, Brooklyn Housing Working Group. Um, so question is, when I organize, I feel like sometimes I default to forms I am most familiar with. Uh, meetings structured like college meetings, political education structured like seminars, outreach to the areas I know. Uh, forms that replicate the interests uh, and cultural assumptions that Christian mentioned earlier. Um, how do we build these forms uh, of meetings, outreach, uh, et cetera, that are more inclusive? Um, do y'all have anything that you'd recommend that, that can help us do this? I think you're muted, Farah. Come over to my own team, Chris. <laughs> you need to be connected to Farris from Forrest's office because that is a major problem, right? The idea that um, if 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 we as an organization, if we as a chapter, do not push the boundaries of the people who are coming in, then we're not doing anything right, right? We have to do something different. Again, I said this because like literally it, it was a call that got me here. If anyone would have known me from the past, would have been like, mm, Farrah, are you? <laughs> You're here? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> but that's because I literally was 
at some point grabbed up, dragged over and be like, yup, Farrah, you're doing this work and a very personal work, right? It isn't just about sitting here and being told, right? Or being taught. At some point you gotta ask yourself, well, what do I want to learn? What do I need to learn and ask for it? Or jump into something that you've never thought you would be in before. So I would definitely encourage you, Chris, if you feel like you know you're you're tired of the norm, jump in into office, ju jump into you know the work that I'm doing in the office. Um, you're in Brooklyn. Come in. We'll we'll teach you some things. We have constituent cases that will teach you how to call the Department of Labor and get somebody their payments. We have constituents, uh, uh, constituent cases that will teach you, hey, this is how you help this little old lady get her heat back on. And then eventually you'll realize throughout it all that it is, it, this is how we build a movement. It isn't about talking about you know socialism as a whole, but socialism has to serve the people. So you have to come in and serve. So, um, and this is what I think a lot of the things that Ashley was talking about, when you join that picket line, you literally have to serve your colleagues. You have to serve the people that you're working with beyond just working with them. So if it means cup of coffee, making sure childcare is covered, making sure that this person, it can pay the bill on time. That means that you gotta come out of pocket. Yes, this is what the movement calls on, uh, demands, excuse me. So if you're ready to serve, come on in, jump in wherever. I say jump in on my office, but you can jump in wherever. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I would completely reiterate that, absolutely. And I think even um, adding to just like smaller things like having food at meetings, super important. Like if there's food there, I will go. Just letting y'all know, that's all it takes for me to get to show up is have food there. Um, even better if it's like, you know, potluck style. I mean, people are always, uh, I know my mom would love the opportunity to, to cook and that would be her way of contributing to meetings. Um, I think also uh, the importance of making sure that our spaces are multi-generational, um, not just for our older comrades, but children. <laughs> um, and I say that because so much of the work that I've gotten to do um, has happened with parents and um, they bring their children to meetings. I'm usually the person holding the baby. I have famously chaired a local meeting holding a baby. Um, and, um, you know, because then you don't just build relationships with the parents, you also build relationships with the children. And so that, you know, the parent can participate more, more, um, you know, actively because then the, the child will feel comfortable, you know, being, being with people who aren't their parents. Um, and, you know, they're, they're able to, it's essentially like you're able to actually effectively like watch, uh, watch the child or, you know, um, engage them in, I think there, we have some chapters who've, who have some like I think DSA sprouts or something along those lines um, to really make sure that um, you know children are part of this movement and they are part of the work that we need to do. Um, and I mean, I know some kids who've attended more protests, done more block walking, and participated in workshops more than some adults um, because both of their parents were able to participate in this organizing work um, without feeling like they were burdening or or without having to constantly say like sorry for you know a child just like processing their emotions and stuff and so being open and receptive to that type of um I guess like meeting space that sometimes it's going to be loud sometimes it's going to be messy but that's totally okay <laughs> it's totally worth it um and I think again you know making sure that we remember at the end of the day people will show up for what they care about as long as we make it explicitly known and we tell them what they need and they tell us what they need and we are also able to meet those needs so not just uh, you know what was said about material needs to you but even like things like transportation do folks need rides to to where you're going like how are you making it um and making it as easy as possible to participate essentially yeah one of the things i was thinking about in relation to this question um because sometimes i i do i do struggle with that like how much of that is a barrier how much of that is actually a real thing because one of the things I, I've learned as a labor organizer is really just to tap into what people already know and really make those connections, meet people where they're at. So I represent a lot of social services workers. And so I tell them like, look, we have processes and procedures at our job that we have to follow. We have to take case comments and case narratives 
document what's happening to you like you're documenting what you're doing with your clients. You know, making those connections really, I think, helps people put, get a frame of reference and put things in perspective. You know, unions use Robert's rules. We use it in DSA, make that connection for people. Um, one of the things too, you know, in labor, and especially because I work in the public sector is connecting politics to our job. You know, it's not, a, that's not different than what we're doing in DSA. You know, our jobs are political, they're funded by taxes. Our bosses ultimately are the elected officials. That's what we do in our unions. That's what we're doing in DSA. So I think being having these experienced organizers be able to make those connections, have those one-on-ones with folks and really draw those connections really helps DSA seem a lot less scarier. Um, but also too, we do have to support folks here so that they don't burn out because I've heard numbers of times like from other BIPOC folks, they're like, I wouldn't have kept coming to meetings if I didn't see you there in the, in the room. And so we have to support the folks who are here because that, that stuff actually does matter. And, you know, I, when we were still organizing in person, I made a point to you know, sort of seek out other folks that look like me, be like, hey, how are you? I hope you stick around, <laughs> you know, and keep in contact with people. You know, those loose connections become those organizing connections. And so I think, again, bringing the socialist movement closer to the labor movement really helps with that because, you know, the few times I did canvas for Bernie, a lot of people would say, you know, the union organizers are the best organizers. They're the they're, they're best canvassers out here. And it's because we spend so much time talking to so many different kinds of people every week. I mean, the amount of organizing hours a labor organizer does compared to what you're necessarily doing in DSA is like, you know, three, four times fold the number of hours you're doing in DSA. So it's really incumbent upon us that we keep building those connections with the labor movement because there's a lot of organic leaders there and they share our politics and we just have to cut through all the noise. You know, there's all the cultural, you know, buzzwords that really are meant to divide people, but we need to really point like, don't you want like more pay? Don't you want to make sure that eviction moratoriums are extended through COVID? Like you just have to make sure that you're having these really clear conversations with folks and really tapping into the issues and understanding people's life stories. Is that means a lot of listening too. You know, that's one of the best pieces of being an organizer, spending 80% of the time listening and 20% of the time talking. Thanks, Ashley. Um, so I wanted to ask a question that's directed at Christian, but, but, uh, Ashley, Farah, feel free to answer too. Um, so Christian, you spoke about members of your community beginning to kind of understand their power, uh, through the work that you were doing, um, on the, on the abolition or on their, on this, on the budget rather. Um, how as, as DSA, do we build on that? and work with people in our communities uh, who may be skeptical uh, of DSA because of our demographic makeup. Yeah, I mean, that's that's like, the, that's a money question right there um, for the organization. I think, you know, being able to really lean into like being brave with our organizing um, because I think there's often this timidity to doing something because we don't feel, um, like it's our place to do this type of organizing. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I do think that if we if we know what's going on, if we if we see the reality that um, of how capitalism is completely ravishing our communities, the people that we care about, people, you know, people we don't even know, but we still want to make sure that they have a life of dignity, um, then it is incumbent on us to do something about it. Um, and I think that sometimes we, we sort of like shy away from that, like, oh, well, you know, I, I don't want to. And um, I think ultimately it's sort of that like oscillation back and forth between knowing what you need to do and then not actually doing it, um, where you kind of get lost in, in the analysis and then nothing ever really happens. Um, and so I think it's, it's super important that when we are doing any type of work, it's also necessary to have an assessment of like what work exists already, um, particularly in that realm, because um, it's entirely possible that there are already, you know, smaller organizations who are doing the type of work that we want to be doing as DSA um, and, you know, are not funded by anybody. They're not, you know, um, doing it. They're not doing anything different than what we would probably do, but they're just not doing it as DSA. And so I think there are plenty of instances there where we can seek out those organizations and build genuine relationships with them and being transparent about the fact that like, hey, we want to build relationships with you because we want to fight the same fight. 
Um, and so being able to uh, acknowledge also that like these fights are going to have multifaceted approaches um, because we need every approach we can we can take to to fight uh, the the large isms that we're that we're combating. And so I, I mean I I hate to like break it down to something super. I mean, maybe I don't hate to do it. <laughs> I'm going to break it down to something super simple in that, like, organizing is about relationships and about power. And, like, at the end of the day, building those relationships, it's 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 not sexy work at all. It, it's a lot of, like, people don't want to talk to you. <laughs> people are going to ignore you. Like, working through a lot of shit. But, like, it's worth it. It's worth it to be able to do it. And there's so much, so much of that work to do. Um, so anyone who's saying, I don't have enough to do, Hey, we've we got lists. We can we can get those things done. Um, but then at the end of the day, also realizing that we are fighting for power. We're not fighting for representation. We're not fighting for anything other than power. Um, and so really making power as a focal point of like why we want to do things. And we're not accepting crumbs like we want everything um, because the working class deserves everything. Um, and so I think being able to really reinforce that whenever we're making those decisions and acknowledging that organizing takes time, trust takes time to build. Um, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, really sticking to it and being committed um, shows, shows a lot of results in the end. Or do you want to go or? Y'all just jump in at, at, at will whenever you want. Okay, I'm just gonna add a quick thing. Um, I think one of the things too that would help is like salient issues, issues that really matter. You know, Christian and Sue Mobley, who's a comrade down on this call, and I worked on a voting rights um, resolution that's on the consent agenda. And we want to start running a voting rights um, campaign in DSA and, you know, socialist parties and socialist organizations, communist parties and have always made you know, the franchise, a centerpiece of their organizing work, because there's no way you can have a workers party and vote for independent socialists running if you don't even have the right to vote. And just in this 2020 election, even 2016, we have seen Republicans go full out on how they've decided to really assault and roll back a lot of um, voting rights for people. So I think that's also important too. And that's going to put us into um, the same space that a lot of people who are already doing this work. And so I think that's really important as well, because we can then talk to them and sort of extend that conversation be beyond just voting at the ballot box, which is one piece of building power. But what's in the next piece of building power? You have to build organization so that you can sweep into office and take state power so you can really deliver for the working class. Because like Christian said, the working class deserves everything. We, sh we should be running this. You know, we own the world. We make this stuff. So like, let's enjoy the fruits of our labor. Right. So I think that's really important as well is that we're also picking issues that are also salient and very immediate, you know, to folks of color, because my reality is very different when I am terrified every day I go outside that the cops are going to like end my life or anybody that I know that looks like me. So we really have to pick issues too that matter. And there's history seeing that like the Socialist Party dropping the ball around lynching in the early 20th century. So there's history there and it's important to know that history so that we can keep repeating the same mistakes. Um, I think that's all I'm going to add for that piece. <laughs> Got anything to add, Farah? Okay, cool. So this one, actually, I'll, I'll ask Farah a question. Um, so this is about some work that happened with locally with New York City DSA. So um, New York City DSA's Tax the Rich campaign uh, made a big impact uh, last legislative session. Uh, but unfortunately, we didn't win all of the transformative reforms we demanded. Um, given what you said in your talk about using your tenant organizing experience, your union experience uh, to inform your work as a legislator, uh, what lessons have you learned uh, and DSA can learn uh, about how we can be sure to win our demands in future legislative fights? Yes. So with Tax the Rich, I think that was amazing. Um, because one thing people didn't understand and they didn't see when we first walked into the door and had our first, um, like my first conference, right? Conversations amongst other legislators behind closed doors um, is the fact that 
I, along other legisl other legislatures that legislature legislators that identify as socialists like Zora and Marcella, but then additionally to other progressives that signed on to this letter, basically kind of calling out our future colleagues, right? Saying like, yo, you know, this is not right regarding, I think it was Palestine, I don't remember the issue, but it was like, basically we were like, no, you know, we need to do something different. So we clearly came in with an agenda to shake things up, change things, right? The upsetness of people, the, 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 the pearl clutching that happened, Jesus, you would have thought when when I heard some colleagues talk about the the fear that they had when their very constituents came up to their door and was like, excuse me, um, you need to listen to us, particularly around tax the the rich. Oh, I was I was I was in tears because it was like, oh wow, like this is the disconnect between people and representation. But then I was laughing at the background, like, oh, if you only had seen me a month before, uh, before I got elected, you would have seen me at the door too, knocking on your door too. But it's the idea that, you know, people, the tax the rich campaign really brought politics to people's doors by not only door knocking, door um, flyer hang, hanging, whatever, but it, it, it was directly supported the fact that not only do you have five new socialists in office, right? But then you're also bringing in, um, tying together what was happening across the city, across New York State, which is a lot of people were were banging on the, were, were running on the premise of like housing, healthcare, um, transformative changes, you know, transformative needs, uh, things that people needed in the community, right? So no longer could you sit there and tell me, oh, I don't have immigrants in my district. Um, guess what? We have a DSA chapter in your district. So probably you have immigrants or you probably have issues around housing. You have issues in your district because we're kind of all connected. I talk to people. I'm on calls with people. Um, if, if I see Rot if I could go to Rochester and talk to tenants on on um, tenant issues in Rochester. So I don't want to hear about the legislators saying, oh, it, we don't have any evictions issues in my district. No, I no. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because I was there, and our people are there. Working people are there. So stop that nonsense. Um, but yes, the tax the rich campaign was amazing. But it also showed up that showed that you know a lot of the issues that we were talking about outside. Um, it changed the tone of what was happening on the inside. You could not act like you didn't know that there was a major movement happening. Um, and then also I was hearing uh, from other legislators be before that when we talk about housing re regarding the rent stabilization, um, the nine package of nine bills, there, it, it took 10 years, um, it took a long time, but by the time that that momentum had built in 2019, when I came in thinking like I was doing something serious, uh, well, I was doing something serious, getting arrested for housing, but there was so much work that it would, that getting arrested that day was the final, bloop. you know, just, you know, I didn't, I didn't end up in jail, but that was, that was it. It was like, bloop. when you, when it, when you really, really knock on doors or knock on things so hard that you realize that these things are paper thin, really. Um, because if you have people backing you up, then you can't stop that. You can't deny it. I hope I answered that question correctly. That makes sense. But yeah, that was a good that was a good answer, Farrah. Thank you. Um, I got a question for Ashley. Um, so, in what ways is the the DSLC, the Democratic Socialist Labor uh, Commission, uh, helping DSA members and the labor movement as a whole? push for the kind of social movement unionism you were talking about uh, in your talk? Uh, and how can DSA members, how can we as DSA members help or plug into those efforts? Okay, good question. So normally we would have had the committee report from DSLC by now, <laughs> you would have actually heard everything. So I, I don't wanna upstage my co-chair Zach about it too much, but um, 
join the DSLC because there are emails that go specifically out to folks who are in the DSLC. So even though you're a DSA member, you're not going to get all the emails that are specific to DSLC stuff. Um, we have membership meetings quarterly. Um, and there's a number of ways to plug in. We have, you know, industry network, sectoral network. So if you're an entertainment worker or an education worker or a restaurant worker, there's ways to plug in around that organizing. Um, the restaurant organizing project has been doing really phenomenal work in various places around the country. Um, we have a health workers collective who want to organize around Medicare for all. So these are these are things that do matter, you know, especially during COVID and EWOC. You know, there's a panel right now actually covering a lot of that stuff, um, and they're scheduled for the same time. Um, helping workers organize through um, COVID has been huge. So partnering with UE, then partnering with CWA and the painters through the ProAct work. I mean, it's actually unreal that a socialist organization has been able to partner with unions, you know, for so long because of a Cold War and um, all of that sort of like Cold War propaganda you know, that has been something that we could not do. You know, they used to make you swear lo loyalty statements when you joined a union saying that you weren't a socialist or a communist. You know, those days are over. Um, people aren't scared of the word socialism anymore in the same kind of way. Um, well, we've been calling Democrats socialists for four years. So it doesn't mean anything. Anymore. <laughs> so I think that work has been huge. You know, working with the PROAC, making those million calls, you know, we're working very closely with the Green New Deal Committee about um, a Green New Deal for schools. Um, there's tons of work that we're doing around it. And then it also locally, a lot of chapters are picking up those wider struggles as well. You know, I'm, you know, sort of involved in m organizing in my union. And that's something that doesn't just matter to us and matters to everybody. I mean, obviously for labor, like all the hours that we spend negotiating over our healthcare benefits, we could devote to organizing for other things and maybe working on organizing more people in the unions. But you know, Medicare for all is going to benefit everyone. Um, so there's there's tons of things. Green New Deal, there's a lot of work right now with um, workers in the fossil fuel industry about trying to lead that transition. Um, I've been in, sort of in touch through, you know, my labor council work, sort of finding out about the refineries in my area and what they're doing to transition. Um, and I'm hoping, you know, we're in early discussions about how to sort of bring that work together with DSLC. Um, we do a lot of strike support, you know, that's a big one as well. And, you know, depending on who's striking, they're making those demands for the common good. So in Chicago, um, Chicago DSA supported CTU and CTU organized around a lot of those bargaining for the common good social justice union issues because they were organizing around rent, making sure families could stay in their home during COVID. Um, Oakland teachers and UTLA teachers, and there's another other higher education unions too that have been organizing to get school um, police out of they were K through 12 schools and off college campuses too, because they know that that stuff matters and that has a real impact on their children's ability to learn. So it's pretty broad, you know, labor is, a, it's a big thing, even though the movement's only about 10%, represents 10% of workers, there's still 14 million people in that movement. And, you know, it's growing, you know, right now, I think under COVID people have really started to reassess their relationship to work. Um, and we'll see what happens when, uh, the unemployment benefits end because I think we could sort of think like this is a, a strike. They want to say it's a labor shortage, but I'm like, maybe people are actually kind of striking by not working right now, not going back to these crummy jobs that they left. So that's something I've been sort of thinking about, but something that we also need to position ourselves and be ready to take advantage of because I don't think people are going to take that anymore. They're not going to work at Taco Bell for 725 and have people yelling at them like they were before. I hope they don't because they don't deserve that. Thank you, Ashley. Um, so taking in one more audience question, and then I'm going to wrap up um, with a question of my own uh, to send us off. Um, a question from uh, anonymous audience member. Uh, and Christian kind of touched on this, but I want to ask it again um, just to see what other folks have to say. How do we balance the urge to concretely uh, grow DSA with the need to respect community slash ethnic based organizations that have longer histories in the communities we're trying to organize them. Um, I think Christian touched upon this a little bit a bit before. Um, this requires really, really deep organizing. Um, there is no un 
manned, unknown, uh, unmanned territory. Once you step into a community, there have been ties there, there's been organizations. Somehow this, or this community has, you know, had some ways, some stop gaps in place to prevent complete uh, annihilation, right? So there is, you never come into a, a, a raw community. That's impossible. There even Christopher Columbus coming over to America. We know there was people there. So go ahead, try to see if you, when you step into the space and want to establish a DSA chapter or you want to expand your DSA chapter, it's important for you to then go and talk to people. Talk to them. Knock on people's door. Go to other people's meetings. Say hello. You know, I know, I know, you know, we have the answer. Yes, I, I know we do it really well and we do it very good. But um, there's something about resilience that as, um, probably maybe very frank, as, as DSA members, we can learn from other people, the niceties, the ni how, how people talk to each other when there is nothing at the table. Um, coming from a, a, a black community, when we have been given scraps for years, you develop a way of talking to one another about these scraps that, you know, coming in saying, hey, by the way, did you know you could have universal healthcare? It doesn't settle. It doesn't just hit automatically. You have to learn how to talk to people. You have to learn how to provide services to people, provide services in a very real way. Christian, please hold my baby in the next meeting, please. You know, because I'm going to need you to hold my baby so I can continue being what I need to, you know, do to be at this meeting. You know, food. Food is so important because you don't know where that person is coming from. If they'll have food on... Uh, at home, I've come to meetings where I was like, well, dinner is, 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 is probably, I don't know, but I'm going to grab this pizza right here while I can, you know? So um, as far as how to reach in, deep organizing, getting into folks' business, be at the community board, be at this um, a, a sidebar, you know, these people are uh, making this little community action group, join the community garden. How about that? Figure out how people get, you know, basic elements to the tape to the house. Um, business means whatever it is, participate, and then that's when you'll learn about your community, and then that's when you're able to then speak to them about issues um, that you know are are high up there. Medicare for all. That that when you when you when you join them, that's when you can speak on these things. And then they'll be able to they'll be able to see it more now because they know you. Not only you're coming in with good intention, you're part of the crew, and then also they they can see how you made the connection and how they can make the connection to the issues too. Uh, I'm gonna jump in real quick. Cool. Um. And maybe, you know, people know what I'm going to say here, but, you know, the rank and file strategy, getting union jobs, that that puts you into contact. A lot of unions have relationships already with a lot of organizations in the community, and they have very established relationships. You know, my union is probably one of the better ones for that in the Bay Area. Um, we are well trusted, and a lot of people look to us for leadership in a lot of different things, and we're in coalitions with other groups. Um, so that that's critical because... When you're working with somebody four hours a week, you can find out, oh, you're part of this church, or you're part of this bowling league, you're part of these different things. You know, part of like organizing is actually spending social time with people, you know, getting to know folks, going to somebody's 60th birthday party next January, you know, like sometimes that's organizing, you know, getting to know people on a regular, just human level. You know, you cannot, every time you're talking to somebody, you cannot always be asking them something. You got to have those neutral conversations, you know, in the kitchen, washing your dishes from the day over the water cooler, whatever. But sometimes you just need to hang out. And that is an important part of um, organizing too, so they know that you're not just some weird socialist freak with your flag all the time, <laughs> you know? Give your, your coworkers a ride to work when their car breaks down. Like that kind of stuff also man, uh, matters. And if you're committed to a community, you know, and I think that's probably a thing that DSA really struggles with just because of like 
the age group of what people are. They're very transient. One of the things I look to for success in DSA chapters is like, how many people are from that area that are in your organization? Like, are you actually speaking to people who actually were raised in that area and still in that neighborhood? You know, I grew up in the East Bay um, and I'm in East Bay DSA. Like, I have roots here. You know, that's another metric to know. Like, are we really doing our job? Because if people are moving around every two to three years, you can't really build those revolutionary relationships. You're not going to be able to commit to a struggle. So pick a place and stay there for a decade, two decades. That's how you build relationships. And that's how people start to trust you because you show up time after time. They're like, I remember you at the city council four years ago, we were fighting for that um, tax measure. It's nice to see you again. That stuff matters. Oh my God, can I go back this in just a little bit? You know? Please. Um, is this, actually you said it, you said it, stay a while. And if you're not gonna stay a while, it's okay. It's, it's okay, you know, just play your part though, but don't get mad, you know what I mean? Don't get mad when people criticize you for not being part of the community. I remember, you know what's so interesting is I, I ran with um a, a slate, right? So it was a group of us. And I remember Marcella. Now, Marcella probably never knew me, never seen me. But back in 2016, when I was just starting to do my little thing on the side and seeing Marcella and seeing that, you know, she's been doing the work and people gravitate. She's been in the community for years, I think 15, I don't know. Her little girl was little and now her big girl, her girl is big. So she's been there, you know what I mean? And then now to see me running with a woman like that, if anything else, like about my race, about running an electoral campaign, seeing a, me a member of the slate like that, a person like Marcella Matanis legitimized what we were doing. You know, it kind of added a little sprinkle of we, we real. Because if, if we can pull in somebody like that and put us next to someone like me, who really electorally, um, as far as organization is really new to all of this, but we're able to marriage the two and then say, this is our product. But that takes time. That takes time, that takes a lot of dinners. That takes a lot of holding babies. That takes a lot of, um, hey, sis, um, by the way, I didn't see you at the last meeting. Uh, where you at now? You okay? Oh, we, oh, you moved? You need some help? Something like that. And you'll be surprised. Again, Marcella didn't know me, but she was one of the main reasons why I decided to run as like as a slate. You know what I mean? It's because of her and along a lot of other people like that I knew that was holding me down back in 2016. And here we are, 2020, and y'all are still holding me down. Thank you, Farah. So DSA members, stop moving around. Stick around up someplace for a while and, and, and build where you're at. And then, then, then we'll get socialism. Um, so one, one last question for me. It seems like, OK, so. We say we need to build a multiracial movement for socialism. We, we all believe that. It's assumed. Um, but I want to ask each of you, why is it so important that our movement be multiracial? Why is it so important for socialism, uh, for our movement to include all shades of the working class? Um, I can I, I can go. Um, I mean, I, I, I think it's pretty basic in that like none of us are free until all of us are free. It's it's really that simple because we, you know, with socialism, we are trying to combat every form of oppression and exploitation and being able to see the way that like these differences um, have been intentionally created in order to divide us. And so being able to work through all of those um, different, the different ways that capitalism affects us and not in a way that's dismissive or erases the very realities of what those are, but making sure that at the end of the day, when we all show up for the fight, like that everyone gets to show up. Um, and because I think right now we are seeing the way that um, these institutions and these systems are really uh, hurting particular segments of the working class more than others. They are affecting the working class more than others. We've seen that. Um, you know, show up with the with the uprisings and with police violence, largely not only 
um, targeting black communities with the violence of the police, but also uh, acknowledging that like those communities are often the most under-resourced because those resources are going to the police. So it's just like a, a double whammy. And so being able to say like, okay, we need, we need these folks to be part of this fight. So that's the issue that needs to be central to our fight so that they can show up to the next fight. And so we're constantly trying to bring more and more people on board um, in order to effectively realize that we have to unite the working class in order to take on the capitalist class in a final type of way, like the final showdown, if you will. And that's gonna take time. Um, it's gonna take a lot of difficult conversations, but at the end of the day, I believe it's the only way for us to, to win, win the, the bigger fight for socialism. The fight for socialism has to be multiracial because we are interrupting every time we have a meeting, every time we knock on the door, every time we have a conversation, um, a conversation with somebody other than ourselves. We are interrupting the narrative that is constantly bombarding you, constantly bombarding others that us, that we are meant, we, we, we're different. Um, I, I, I can't imagine, I still can't imagine myself being here today because so much has been, I've been put on a track since I was like, what? five, seven born, that I would not be here. The fact that I can stand up as a black woman, as a daughter of Haitian immigrants to be able to say something, have a platform today, that's because of, of a movement of, of inclusivity that directly interrupts every pathway that would have steered me someplace else. And that's why it's important for us to continue this work, for you to stop and say, hey, someone's missing here, and that's the question that is the important question not how we get pizza only to the meeting or how do we you know get another aoc no how do we include everybody my neighbor next door has to be in this room for us to move ahead because we have to interrupt these narratives interrupt these lives because we know that in the end what what the goal is of the outside the alternative of capitalism or um, neoliberalism is to separate people, to make them feel small, to make them feel powerless. But our our movement, our socialism works because we attack that. We take people out and say, you are powerful, you have voice, you have agency just by being the person that you are. That's it, you know, janitor or president. It doesn't matter, you're here and you matter. And so, um, it's so beautiful and I, I love this and, and it's it's amazing to be part of this and I want everybody to be on it. So it requires a lot to whom much is given, much is required. So it's like you have to, it's a, it takes a lot, but it's so worth it. So worth it. Christian, you still didn't answer when you're gonna hold my baby. So, um, Christian and I have talked about this a lot about uh, a vision and what we have to remember is socialism is ultimately about human liberation. That's why we're socialists. We're here to free ourselves from domination, oppression, and exploitation. We're not here just because I like this system better than another system. We're here because we want to have free lives, live our best lives, be our best selves, really reach our full potential. If I didn't have to struggle out here in the streets for socialism, I'd probably be an artist or I don't know, gardening. I mean, think about all the things that we are sacrificing you know, all the things that we could be doing, all that lost talent, all that, all those songs that aren't being written, all those poems that aren't being written. Think about that stuff. We could be having that if we were free. So that's ultimately what socialism is about. It's about human liberation. So to me, like, if you start digging deep, you know we're all connected anyway. You know, families are mixed, people move across the world. At the end of the day, we're all deeply connected. So people losing acres and acres of the Amazon, that affects all of us because those are the lungs of the world. We all breathe that oxygen. We are all connected. So to me, it's very simple. You know, as Christian and Farah have said, it's very simple. We can't, if there's one group that's not free, they're gonna extend that to the rest of us, the ruling class. You know, they, they perfected capitalism in a lot of ways during slavery and this sort of lean management and all these, you know, surveilling and monitoring and they perfected that then, and they're using it now on us now. So you have to remember that this is ultimately about freedom. That's what socialism is about. 
Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Farrah. Thank you, Christian, uh, for a wonderful panel. I hope everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, so I think we can adjourn. Uh, good luck in all your adventures and your fights and getting us all free. Everybody have a good night.